Hello, everyone. I'm Thane Rosenbaum. I'm the creative director of the Forum on Life, Culture, and Society at Turo College. And in partnership with our friends at the New York Film Academy, welcome to the Folk Series Conversations on Essential Cinema. Tonight's film, Alan J. Pakula's All the President's Men, nominated for eight Academy Awards and for a time turned journalists into rock stars. Uh, our special guest tonight is Liz Holtzman, an iconic New Yorker who you will meet uh, in a moment. Uh, our series, Conversation on, on Essential Cinema, has been wildly successful. Uh, this is now its second year. We had Sharon Stone for uh, Casablanca, and we had Matthew Modine for 12 Angry Men, and we had uh, the actor William Fitchner for The Graduate, and we had the comedy writer Alan Swibel for Charlie Chaplin's The Great Dictator. And tonight's film, as you all know from having either watched it before or watched it to prepare for tonight, is the film that charted, tracked two young reporters, uh, Woodward and Bernstein at the Washington Post, who broke the story on the Watergate burglary of the Democratic National Committee in the Watergate complex and followed the story all the way to the resignation of President Nixon. And when the story started, uh, no one had confidence in the story. No one, none of the other major media outlets covered it. And so the movie has sort of the high drama of what did a major newspaper do with two young reporters in, in a story that for many people believe was improbable, that the president would have engaged in a cover-up uh, of a burglary against his uh, uh, opponent uh, when he ended up winning 49 of the 50 electoral states. Um, Liz Holtzman. Um, well, before we meet her, uh, there's so much to say. Uh, she is truly uh, uh, one of the most fascinating and iconic of New Yorkers. Uh, I think of her like the 1969 Knicks. She's timeless and she's treasured by so many people. Her name alone evokes memories for so many people. So many people wrote us thanking us for doing this movie and having Liz with this movie. Everyone knows that she was in 1972, uh, at the time of this, the story of All the President's Men, she was a newly elected 31-year-old Jewish girl from Brooklyn. Uh, the, at the time, uh, the youngest uh, female elected to Congress that record, by the way, was held for 42 years, most recently broken by AOC. And you could say that Liz Holtzman was the original AOC. And in so many ways, you know, they were uh, underdogs. They mounted grassroots campaigns. They defeated incumbent uh, uh, Congress persons who didn't take them seriously. The one slight difference I think is bears mentioning is that Liz was not a bartender. Uh, before she became a congresswoman. But let me tell you something about the people of Brooklyn. They did not hold it against her, that even without that credential, they still brought Liz Holtzman to Congress. Now, I'm going to show that clip to AOC. I hope she has a good sense of humor, because <laughs> I'd like to invite her to do, to do folks, and I hope that she'll like that little joke. Um, uh, so uh, Liz also uh, was the first uh, female uh, district attorney for Kings County, Brooklyn. She was also the first female elected to be city comptroller. And there was a dark day in New York politics for people like me and many, many, many others when Liz Holtzman ran for US Senate uh, and narrowly lost to Al D'Amato. And I think the country would have been very, very different had Liz Holtzman been in the United States Senate all these years. It was a real loss. That was in 1980. Um, uh, before we start, I think, um, Two other quick points. First, we're not unfamiliar with this territory. We had John Dean a few years ago uh, in connection with the CNN uh, documentary called Tricky Dick. And so uh, if many of you remember, if you were there live with us, John Dean was the counsel of the president. He was the one who testified before the Watergate Select Committee. I'm sure his name will come up again today, but we had John Dean. The other thing I would say is that uh, Liz has been at the law firm of Herrick Feinstein for many, many years. And we've had a connection at Herrick Feinstein. Uh, one of the, uh, the longtime chairman of the firm, uh, Harvey Feuerstein's son, Mark Feuerstein, was a guest, if you remember, on Conversations on Essential Cinema when we did The Godfather 2. 
So look at this little triangulation with, and it has a connection with Mark Feuerstein and Herrick Feinstein and Liz Holtzman. And in order to deal with some of our financial issues, I think that we should, folks should just simply become a wholly owned subsidiary of Herrick Feinstein and the partners at the firm should consider that as you hear Liz. Let me welcome everyone, Liz Holtzman. Hi, my friend. Hi, hi, <laughs> so great to be with you. And thanks for that introduction. And by yeah. the way, <laughs> about AOC, she actually acknowledged um, my, the fact that I was a kind of predecessor for her because she did say before me, there was she, meaning- Oh, I love me. that. So I love that. <laughs> that, may, that makes me like her more. So thank you for that. That's great. Anything, anything that every, anyone who acknowledges and recognizes Liz Holtzman is good in my book. So Liz, you saw the movie to, to talk about, we're going to talk about this and so many other things over the next you know, 58 minutes or so. Uh, oh, before we go ahead, if you've been watching us, on, uh, watching us live on YouTube, welcome. Uh, make sure that you sign up for our, um, our channel and also uh, 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 sign up to get uh, email announcements of future events at folks.org. And if you have a question for Liz, go to the Q&A box and leave your question, send it, and hopefully we'll have some time at the end. Um, so Liz, you watched this movie in preparation for this. I'm just curious, what, 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 what did it make you think? What memories did it evoke for you? Well, of course, <laughs> it evoked so many memories and I love the movie. I think if uh, you haven't had a chance to see the movie in preparation for this show, anyone who hasn't done that, just do yourself a favor and see the movie because it's really, it's a wonderful movie. It was very well done. And the best part about it is in a way, not just that young people wind up being the main actors and the main movers and shakers, they're the ones who bring good at, uh, to result. But the fact is that this is a happy ending in the sense that good wins out over evil. The bad guys lose. That's not always the case in American politics as we see today. So um, it's a kind of feel good movie in every kind of uh, way. But what it made me think about was, and you know, ironically, and we talked about this a little bit before the show started, um, my headquarters, when I was running for Congress. <laughs> Tell them. In June, 1972, I was running to be a Congresswoman against Emanuel Seller. He was the chair of the House Judiciary Committee. He'd been in Congress for 50 years. And that Saturday night before the primary, which was in late June, my campaign headquarters was broken into and my campaign manager was actually beaten up. So I was not paying attention to Watergate. The, whatever break-in took place in Washington was about as remote as it could be. <laughs> I was worried about my own campaign manager's health. <laughs> Actually, luckily, I mean, he was taken to the hospital, but he was okay. And the fact that our offices were broken into just days before the primary election. Of course, in retrospect, when I got involved in Watergate, it was amazing that, you know, there was this break-in in Brooklyn. Nobody paid attention to it. It wasn't that important, thank God. Uh, but there was a break-in that took place just about the same time that shattered American history. So yeah. speaking, of, speaking of American history, Liz, when you think of the movie or see the movie, do you say to yourself, you know, I actually was a part of American history. When the movie ends, if there was a sequel to All the President's Men, it would move ahead to what happened in Congress. And you had just recently been elected to Congress. Remember the movie ends with the inauguration of Richard Nixon, which coincided with the inauguration investiture when Liz Holtzman started to represent for the first time, she was a four term Congresswoman, but that's when you commenced your first term. And then you ended up being appointed to the Judiciary Committee and was a very active participant in the Nixon uh, impeachment proceedings. I mean, do you pinch yourself when you think of the movie and say, you know, I mean, this was a pivotal moment in American history and I was a 31 year old girl from Brooklyn and there I was in the, minute, in the middle of it. But the most important thing you have to know about my being in the middle of history is that the fact that I was put on the House Judiciary Committee and that took place in December of 1972 before Nixon was inaugurated right. was the clearest sign that nobody had any idea 
that Nixon was going to be impeached, that the House Judiciary Committee was going to be in the center of history because the cover-up had been so successful that it wasn't on anyone's mind. You have to be sure that if anybody had even the slightest inkling that the House Judiciary Committee would have been in the center of history, Liz Holtzman would never have been put on it because but. I had no powerful people supporting me. I actually lobbied to get off the House Judiciary Committee. I knew they were thinking about appointing me because I was a lawyer. My predecessor had been on it. It was a vacancy, easy to fill, no brainer. You were a 31 year old it. Harvard Law graduate. I thought that was one of the reasons they said, how could we deny a 31 year old no, fi no, firebrand? No, no. No. Everybody else wanted to be on the House Judiciary Committee. I didn't because my predecessor had been there for 50 years and and I and my very brilliant advisors sat down and said, no, we shouldn't really try to get on Judiciary <laughs> Committee because you know he'd been representing the, the district for 50 years and on the committee, I wanted to do something different. <laughs> I just follow in his footsteps. So it's just the, the sign that the, the cover-up was so successful that it wasn't until later in um, January when Judge Sirica, when the burglars came up before Judge Sirica and he said, you know, there's something fishy about this whole process. He said, I, I mean, you know, they had people who'd worked for the CIA. This was an or and you had the Democratic National Committee being burglarized. And the Justice Department hadn't reached to any higher ups. He didn't like how, how it looked. He didn't like anything about it. There was something just smelled. And he said, I'm gonna impose really stiff sentences and Congress, you better do something about it. And the Senate did. And the Senate Watergate Committee, uh, the, the formulation of the Senate Watergate Committee came out of, of Judge Sirica's um, plea for congressional action. And that just the whole process began to unravel at that point. The whole so cover up began to unravel. So we, when I got on House Judiciary Committee, I said to myself, this is not an auspicious beginning. Here I try, <laughs> I try my hardest not to be on the House Judiciary Committee and they put me on. This is not a good sign that I'm gonna be a success in Congress. So that was The movie suggests, <laughs> I'm wondering whether you said something looks fishy to the Judge Sirica, the movie suggests the fact that the plumbers had high priced attorneys was part of that. Would you agree with that? That that was part of it what- was e Everything about that case just smelled to high right. heaven. So did you, 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 you were again, what you said a moment ago, I was worried about my campaign manager who got beaten up in our own break-in, but you're saying, which is so interesting, you, of course, you were living in New York and you were reading in the New York Times and the New York Times really wasn't covering the story. You were not reading Woodward and Bernstein at that point. No, right? I never heard of that. <laughs> do, do you think that most people, because remember, and even in the movie, it's as if we should give this story to more big name writers, right? And they, you know, on the political desk, I can't remember what desk, maybe they were the local Metro desk. Uh, you know, I just, I'm wondering whether it really was such a non-story. Remember, Nixon wins in a landslide. So the early reporting obviously didn't have much effect on people. And what you're saying it was until Sirica got involved, the judge who sentenced the plumbers, you're saying that's what activated the Senate to create the Senate special committee. Right. And then, of course, you had the special prosecutor created by the Senate. So the, the mechanisms of justice began to start moving, but it but the point is that Nixon's cover-up was so successful that he got reelected in one of the largest landslides in American history. So did you then at some point when you at some point you must have said, holy shit, Liz, this thing might actually go to an impeachment. I can't believe that I didn't want to be on this committee, but I'm I'm really going to be in the middle of this thing. First of all, at some point that must have happened. You might not have said, holy shit, Liz, but you might have said, oh my God, I'm going to be on television every day. <laughs> Everyone's no, going to no, know. No, 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 no. Nobody even envisioned uh, that he would be covered on TV. Work. Remember, nobody, nobody no. thought, right. The first inkling about impeachment came about when the revelations were made about the secret bombing of Cambodia, that the right. president of the United States had been bombing Cambodia to smithereens, lying to Congress about it, saying, oh no, we never bombed in Cambodia, we've just bombed in, in Vietnam. 
And Father Drynan, who was a priest, a Jesuit priest. Uh, Out of Bo Boston, Boston, right? Boston. From Massachusetts, right? From Boston, somewhere around there. Um, took the floor and said, this is an outrage, a violation of Congress's powers to declare war. And he had an impeachment motion. Nobody that went nowhere. But as John Dean testified, and as we began to hear more and more about the cover-up, about not just the break-in, but the these deep sixing uh, files and information that related to the that related to the burglary and the break in, people began to talk a little bit on the, in the House of Representatives, members of the committee, but nobody in the House of Representatives and the leadership was interested in impeachment. And in no, part, no, no, in no, part no. because Nixon was immensely popular. Well, also because the last impeachment was Andrew Johnson, a hundred years before, just about. 104 years. In a I political think. disaster. Everyone said it was political. Everyone said it didn't work. I mean, nobody wanted a repetition of that. They had well, remember, I'm sorry, just remember, there was no Clinton impeachment yet, and there were certainly no Trump impeachment. So what your point is, this just seemed like something Congress doesn't do. Correct. And while the information was you know, kind of very, very troublesome, not kind of, was very troublesome that was coming out of the Senate Watergate hearings. The fact of the matter is, and John Dean's revelations uh, that he told Nixon there was a cancer on the presidency, and then, uh, and Nixon, of course, denied that, but then Alexander Butterfield, who was uh, uh, one of the uh, people who worked in the White House. Another one of the president's men. One of the president's men, but an honorable person, testified honestly that there was a taping system. So everybody knew that there was a way of finding out. Did John Dean tell the truth? Was the president paying off the burglars to keep quiet? Was he offering them pardons to keep them quiet? Or was John Dean an amazing liar? And there was a way to tell that. And, and then, of course, and what happened next was that there was a special prosecutor, which had been set up in response to Sirica's uh, concerns, and also because of the revelations that had come out by that time about the, um, the cover-up. The, the special prosecutor said, I'm going to try to get the tapes, and we'll find out the truth. Now, why and would Nixon people... fired him, and that brought the impeachment to surface. Did anyone even ask the question, why would, why would John Dean lie? Like, why would someone, was that part of the, your point is to say, you don't even have to worry about that. There were tapes. There could be transcripts of the tapes. Eventually there were transcripts, then they actually subpoenaed the tapes. But was there also a question of why would the counsel to the president come before the select committee and say this unless there was something that was wrong? Well, I mean, he seemed very credible. Mm -hmm. He seemed very sincere. I listened to his testimony. I mean, you're a but, former prosecutor soon well, after I that. Well, I wasn't a prosecutor. I know, <laughs> I know, but I'm saying you you are obviously trained to see, to listen to people give testimony. And I'm wondering, you weren't alone in that. Did people say, yeah, well- he, people, he was very credible, which is part of the reason that um, uh, Archibald Cox, the special prosecutor, went after the tapes. I see. And it, he gave credible testimony. Nixon said he wasn't telling the truth. You had the burglary. You had the fact that these people didn't say they were higher ups. You had, well, in any case, when when the special prosecutor went after the tapes and Nixon fire, had him fired, the American people understood what was happening because everybody, we didn't have Fox TV. We didn't have yeah. the internet. We didn't have alternative sources of, of lies. Everybody understood. John Dean said that Nixon had authorized payments to keep to the burglars to keep them quiet. And Nixon said, no, that's a lie. And there was testimony. I mean, there were tapes that would prove who was telling right. the truth. So also when Nixon fired the special prosecutor who was trying to get at the truth, this did not sit well with the American people. And right. there was a huge demand that Congress acted. So right. Congress went into impeachment, not on its own say-so, 
but because it was being demanded by the American people, because it was very clear that Nixon was trying to stop the truth from coming out, and that did not sit well. We're going to come back to the Archibald Cox firing, because I know you'll, we're going to talk a little about the Trump impeachments, because it, there, there are some parallels, and you've written about some of them. So we'll come back to that later. Hopefully, we'll have some time. But I think that you, the point that you made about the firing of the special prosecutor really ignited you know, a lot of public resentment and concern. Outcry. An outcry, Huge right. Outcry. Outcry. That a the kind process- of like a volcanic explosion. Right. That I a mean, lot of the popularity. The phone of the calls. We didn't have, you know, we didn't right. have email then, but the right. letters, the telegrams, the phone calls, just Washington was inundated. Right. And the, and the leadership of the House of Representatives, which had been adamant, like granite, not moving in favor of impeachment, they, the process then started. All and, of a sudden. They, and to answer your question, even when we started the process of impeachment, nobody quite knew what it would look like, what kind of shape it would take, what evidence we would have, how it would turn out. It was all uh, a work in progress. So, the, the, sorry. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. But the, you were about to say. But the critical thing I think for people to understand is that Peter Rodino, who was the chair of the House Judiciary Committee, and by the way, this is another little factoid. Uh, Jimmy Breslin, who was a great reporter, journalist, wrote a book, How the Good Guys Won. And he said, if I hadn't defeated Emanuel Seller in that race, uh, that the impeachment might never have happened. Because Rodino wouldn't have been the chairman. Because Rodino wouldn't have been the chairman. And Rodino handled it in a very dignified, fair, Hmm. um, poised, uh, um, thoughtful manner. And he... His, the way he handled it was nonpartisan. In fact, this is the point I wanted to make. He said, we're going to have for the impeachment inquiry and the Democrats control the House of Representatives, we're going to have a Republican council. And we had a Republican council and the Republicans picked a Republican council. So this was the first signal that this wasn't going to be business as usual. It was no, going it- to be a bend over backwards to show the American people and the Republicans in the House and the Senate that what we were trying to do was to be completely fair. So it made a big impression. So when uh, we had John Dean, just to create some connection between that pet testimony and when he was on our stage, you know, he started, he's told us an anecdote, which has since been repeated, but that the president at one point said to him, you know, we're gonna have to use some cash to pay off some people. And Dean was describing on our stage that he was sort of appalled by the openness, the frankness of the president's comment about we're gonna to need to, so apparently Dean as the young White House counsel turns to the president, he said, Mr. President, I don't even have any idea how we would even get cash like that. And apparently the president said, oh, there's a safe in the White House that has all that cash. There's a million dollars in cash in the safe. And he told, John Dean told our audience this. He said, you know, to him, that was the moment of defeat, he knew that he couldn't stay with this. He said the president was literally saying the slush fund is in a safe that I control in the Oval Office. So I want to get to the movie for a second, because it does, again, harken back to a a number of things just for people that, you know, there was an era. I mean, you know, first of all, phones, telephones, rotary dials, um, uh, phone booths, phone books, right? How painstaking the investigator of reporting was, the slowness. You mentioned Fox News, right? I mean, the way the movie shows, it's a slow paced movie. It's really about two guys clacking away at, at, on typewriters and editing and having their editors tell them, you don't have it, you don't have it. You can't go out with this, you can't go out with this. I think it should be shocking to people when they watch this movie and then they watch cable news tonight on any of the networks and see how seat of the pants it is, the news comes out today and how editorialized it is. And there you have, you know, the editors of the Washington Post fighting amongst each other. What can we say? What can we prove? What are the actual facts? That's the action of the movie. It's no car chases, but the action is argument about, we, this is super important and it can't be done casually. Well, if they'd done a movie like that of the House Judiciary Committee and its process of impeachment, it would have been pretty much the same. Because had we start this out, of course, we had the two Republican counsels 
for a democratically controlled impeachment process. But we started out first with what is a high crime and misdemeanor? What's an impeachable offense? Nobody on the committee had ever learned this in law school and didn't have any experience with it because the last one was 100 years before. So we had to go back. Which I'm sorry, Liz, just to make sure our audience knows, which did not, re it resulted in impeachment, but not a removal from office, right? Correct. So and Correct. We, even, even when there was 104 years before, we didn't have a victorious Senate trial. We just had the impeachment, but it was 104 right. years ago. Okay, go ahead, sorry. Right, so, so the point is that um, we started out, we had to learn what a high crime and misdemeanor was. We had memos of law on that. We had to read that. I, I got a book on uh, ancient British law. I read through the whole thing. It was one of the most, I mean, it was not the most interesting book I ever read, but I felt <laughs> I had to understand it. It's a little bit like those editors. The members of the committee understood that history would be looking at us and we had to do it in the right way. And Rodino understood it it had to be done in the right way. And why do we feel that? Not just for the test of history, but we didn't think that Nixon would be impeached unless the evidence was there and unless it was presented in a fair way and unless it was presented in a thoughtful way. So our job was to understand the law, understand the facts and present it to the American people. But you and did have- Nobody knew the outcome. We didn't know, nobody took a poll of the members. Nobody knew how anybody was gonna vote. We had three Southern Democrats who had pro-Nixon districts, probably more pro-Nixon than many of the Republican members. And we had the Republicans on the committee, many of whom were very conservative. So nobody knew what the outcome was. And yet what's so interesting with the terrible partisan divide that we live through today, your committee actually had bipartisan support. Well, it wound up having bipartisan support in part because, or I think mostly because Rodino tried to be so fair that he took away all the procedural fights. There were no fights over the procedures. I mean, for example, we called witnesses. The, the, the chair wasn't planning to call witnesses, but the Republicans said, we want witnesses. So they got witnesses. Oh, and by the way, we want the president's counsel to be able to question the witnesses. <laughs> They got that. So those kinds of issues were taken off the table. You couldn't get mad at Rodino because there was some unfairness. You couldn't get mad at the Democrats because there was some unfairness in the process. No, 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 no. You had to focus on the facts and the facts were overwhelming. People think it's just a third rate burglary that we're talking about. I have to remind everybody, what was Watergate about? Yes, it was about the cover up of a burglary, but it was a cover up that used the Justice Department that used, misused the FBI, misused the CIA. It wasn't just an ordinary little cover-up. This was huge, using the huge powers of the president. So you're saying, wait, and that's when the abuse of power article of impeachment was about all of those things. Plus, Nixon was involved in wiretapping journalists, illegal wiretapping of journalists. He tried to bribe a judge. In the Ellsberg case, he he ordered a break in of the El, of Ellsberg psychiatrist's office to get information that would be demeaning to Ellsberg and that he could smear him with. I mean, and he set up a uh, uh, this the uh, the enemies list so that he could get IRS to audit his political enemies. This and things that we didn't even impeach him for were were things like. He said, I, I, can, I don't have to uh, spend money that Congress appropriates. I don't like these programs, particularly these are, uh, these are anti-property programs. Oh, no, no, I'm not spending that money. I'm president, I can do what I want. Oh, I don't like the Office of Economic Opportunity. I'm gonna dismantle it. So, and we had a president engaging in, in these misuse of war powers as well. So you had the background of a president out of control, plus you had so many abuses of power, so much misconduct, some of which was was basically criminal. Wasn't there also the misuse of federal funds to renovate his homes? Yeah, but that we that was not passed as an article of impeachment because it seemed the amounts were relatively small and in comparison with the other charges we had seemed it ultimately not, was not part of the 
didn't yeah. seem to rise to the same so level you're saying, of gravity. I, and I'm glad that you mentioned the using the IRS against this political because that's beyond just the FBI and the CIA. It's also the IRS. The movie gives you this sense, you know, at the end, again, people all of a sudden wanted to go to journalism school. But you <laughs> entered public life <clears throat> at a terrible time where the cynicism about government could not have been lower. Was there also a sense that this was your first term in Congress that you said, this is particularly why the Judiciary Committee needs to do a good job here, because the American people have lost faith in their government. I mean, I would like to know what it was like to be a 31-year-old Congresswoman, first term, knowing that the country thought, President Nixon said, the country needs to know that their president is not a crook. Well, they ultimately discovered that their president was a crook, and so that there was loss of faith in all of government, and there you were in the center of it. But I think the important thing, some people say about Watergate that it was the worst of all times, but you know, what it showed was that the system could work because we had a president who engaged in evil conduct, bad conduct, criminal conduct. He was named an unindicted co-conspirator. Mm -hmm. Grand jury wanted to indict him. So you had a president who engaged in that bad behavior, dangerous to our democracy, dangerous to our country, and yet the system rose up. You had Judge Sirica, a conservative Republican judge, who looked at these five burglars and said, something's wrong with this case. They're all pleading guilty, no higher ups involved, something's wrong with this case. And he did something. And then you had the Senate Watergate Committee, where you had, again, a, a, a important Republican members of that committee, they uncovered additional facts. And you had House Judiciary Committee, which acted on a bipartisan basis. We had almost a third of the Republicans supporting all the Democrats, including the Southern Democrats, voting for impeachment. So, and then you had a Supreme Court that unanimously voted that the president couldn't conceal the tapes, that he had to release them. So you had the judiciary acting, the Congress acting, the American people rising up, the press, all the, all the fail-safe systems in our, in our polity came to the fore to deal with a president out of control. That I, love what, I love what you said about, and it's perfect, the way you connected to the movie, you said that there's a parallel between the painstaking investigation that the Washington Post conducted to get it right that was replicated in the House of Congress and in the Select Committee, that everyone did the same thing, that this was the uniform across the board. No one was casual, everyone was thorough, uh, the judiciary was involved, the Supreme Court ultimately was resolved, involved, which I wanna to get to United States versus Nixon at some point. Let me ask a couple of real quick questions. <clears throat> was there a impulse among congressional leaders that we need to know who Deep Throat is? that we need to get him to testify? We've got to find this guy? First of all, the leadership of the House of Representatives never spoke to me about anything on the committee. Unlike today, where the speaker controls a lot of what happens, this was a bottom-up process. It was, so uh, no one ever said that. They, we, I don't recall that we ever got instructions about anything. In fact, Rodino had decided that the, t that the, the uh, hearings were not gonna be televised. And it was one of the brand new members, uh, Wayne Owens from Utah, Democrat, who said, oh no, the, if the American people don't see our debate, they won't have confidence in the result. They have to see how we arrive at it. And so that decision was overturned. So there was no, <laughs> we were, as I said earlier on, this is a work in progress. Nobody had a blueprint for this from the beginning. Nobody knew what articles would be included, what articles wouldn't be included. In fact, it was this bipartisan group of Southern Democrats and moderate Republicans that at the very end wrote the articles of impeachment. Hmm. That hadn't been planned beforehand. Well, you know, so the, that's how it worked out. But it was on a basis of a lot of work, factual, going into depth in the facts, into the facts and into the law so that people felt comfortable with, with the fact that we were going to remove a president of the United States. See, that was really the core here. How do you, right. at the center of our democracy is the election of the president. Mm -hmm. And if you remove a president, <clears throat> that undoes the will of the people. So you have to be really careful and it has to be done in the right way for the American people to support it 
and for it to be done at all. There's a small part in the movie, not, I don't think everyone picks it up. It's when they're talking to Sloan, who was one of the president's men who was involved on, in creep, I guess, a committee to reelect the president, right. where he says, I want you to know I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a loyal Republican. And Woodward says, so am I. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bernstein looks at him like he's insane. Like, what? You're a Republican? <laughs> and it's a very small scene, but an important one. And you reminded me of it when you said the bipartisan partnership that took place in the Judiciary Committee, where everyone was working together, it was bottom up, Everyone, there wasn't a lot of infighting about procedure. No one was trying to, you know, scam the other one. And that in, in even when it came to the Post's reporting, Woodward and Bernstein was one was a Republican, one, one was a Democrat. And it gives you a sense of that was a different America. Well, because it wasn't Team Nixon. Some of the Republicans felt on the committee that they were part of Team Nixon. Uh, but even they, the holdout Republicans, when the Supreme Court issued its ruling that the tapes had to be um, released, the what's so-called smoking gun tape was released. In that tape, it shows Adam Nixon's own mouth that he ordered the cover-up just days after the break-in. So the holdout Republicans who said, well, we don't have any evidence from the president's own mouth. We can't support it. They said, okay, now we have evidence from the president's own mouth. So they all announced, even after having voted against impeachment, that they would support impeachment. And once you had the whole Judiciary Committee, including all of the really conservative members saying that the facts and the law warranted his removal from office, then there was no question that he so, was going to be voted to be impeached by the House and he would have been convicted in the Senate. So here's something that I have not quite known the answer to. So United States versus Nixon, which essentially is where the Supreme Court rules that the president does not have an absolute or an unqualified privilege to withhold documents in some in a criminal case, which we'll talk about in a minute, because that issue seems to still be alive in these various post-Trump presidencies, both the, you know, I thought that was resolved in United States v. Nixon. It was in the news just the other day. It continues to be invoked that the president has this unqualified power to hold on to it. So I have two questions about the United States versus Nixon. First of all, apparently the White House produced transcripts of the tapes first, and the House decided they were insufficient. They wanted to hear the tapes. Now the question is, that's what Nixon fought up to the Supreme Court. That, does that mean that he was willing to provide the transcripts before the Supreme Court ruled? And if they did, why were the tapes so much better? What, I know there was more vulgarity on the tapes. Uh, they were more colorful. But was the tape that much more revealing than the transcripts? Well, I think we, there are a couple of different things going on here. There were some tapes that were obtained by, I think it's this, by, the, um, by this Watergate grand jury. Those tapes were then turned over to the House Judiciary Committee. They weren't all the tapes. They were some of the tapes. Uh, they were, those tapes um, were hard to hear, but we had them transcribed. They were very important in my opinion. Uh, they weren't conclusive for the holdout Republicans. So the other tapes that were ordered, um, disclosed by the Supreme Court were the one, was the one that made the difference. Were the ones Which is what you the call the smoking gun. The smoking gun tape. But there were tapes, transcripts that Nixon released saying, I've given them, he put these into three ring black notebooks and he piled them up on a desk and they were just, you know, what it was, 40 books or 50 books with these transcripts. Well, we had the tapes in some of those cases and the transcripts were fake. They, it's not that we didn't like them. They just deleted critical stuff. They just completely, um, uh, distorted when it became when when the uh, tapes were were incriminating of Nixon, they just changed this. They just changed them, so that was actually the third article of impeachment, which people don't often know about, don't frequently talk about, uh, was that Nixon tried to obstruct the operation of the impeachment process, and part of that obstruction was giving us tape transcripts that were fake. 
that and themselves he, were cover-ups. Right. So you're saying, right. So you're saying there's two phases. There is the cover-up of the burglary, and then there was the cover-up of the investigation, right? The oh, yeah. obstruction, <laughs> the obstruction that went into, and does that also include the bribes or the bribes of a pardon that I will give you a pardon if you don't, don't talk? Was that yes, also of part? Of, that sure. was this part of the same thing, which by the right. way, also has a parallel with Donald Trump, where there's an offer of a pardon, which is essentially a bribe, right? In, in exchange. So um, um, let me just one quick question. Did you think that the plumbers were too, or anyone was too lightly sentenced? Everyone you know, is- I, I wasn't focusing on that. I thought the fact that they got sentences was important. They had committed crimes. Um, you know, the, the movie ends on that, Liz, right? right? So all of a sudden you get a, the movie ends and they're, you know, the inauguration, you're getting all these headlines. And I felt, again, I thought, really now that we're hearing people pleading guilty and then spending eight months in jail or, you know, it just seemed given the, the assault on our democracy, a term of art that we hear now post January 6th, certainly that was a Watergate, you know, crime and that perhaps I was just curious, since you eventually became a prosecutor, did you think those were two like sentences? As I said, it's not something I focused on, uh, focused on at the time. And, and even now, I, I think the important thing is that they were punished. I mean, that's right. where, the, where we are today, that they're not being punished, that, those, that the president himself and those around him who engaged in criminal conduct or other kinds of conduct are not being held accountable. That's the critical thing. So and this we tried to, that was what impeachment was. And it wasn't just to hold account of somebody accountable because that's a good thing to do, which I do in general think it is, but also because when you have a president who does, who puts himself above the rule of law, he becomes a danger to the country and a danger to our democracy. Impeachment was designed to remove people from positions of power when they threaten the the basic rule of law of the country. That's what happened with regard to Nixon. So we'll just go briefly into the Trump impeachments. Why is it that United States versus Nixon wasn't immediately controlling? Why is it that we're still hearing an argument that says the president has the privilege to engage in open and frank conversations with his men or women who work for him and that none of those people should be afraid that what they say ends up getting, putting them in jeopardy. And that, that we're still hearing the Trump lawyers make that argument that you want, the, you want there to be a free exchange in the overall office. And what's ironic is President Nixon, yes, he had all these really awful conversations that he taped in the Oval Office that in, there was you know, discussing criminal activity. But why is it that that argument just isn't seemingly obvious anymore and that it was invoked yet again in the Trump uh, impeachments to say, uh, remember, you know, no one testified in the Trump impeachments, right? None of his people testified. You're describing an, a real open process where the president's men appeared before Congress. And one of the things that we saw in the Trump impeachments is nobody appeared before Congress. Well, right. I mean, but part of the difference is, is that there was a grand jury proceeding also going on, and there were criminal prosecutions going on of, the, of uh, Nixon's top people. I mean, in the end, his top guys, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, um, Mitchell. Mitchell, and Kleindienst, they all went to prison. And also the I grand think jury went to prison. I'm not 100 percent sure, but they the were all jury, And Liz, the grand jury shared that evidence with Congress. Yes, because they went. We there had to be a court order that permitted that. Because but that's that it, that that gave you evidence that you otherwise wouldn't have had. Right. It was it was grand jury evidence, but the the courts allowed it to be turned over to us, despite Rule Six E of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure that requires secrecy. They were turned over to us, and that was very, very important. I mean, the grand jury and the prosecutors created a roadmap for the House Judiciary Committee. That was vital information. We got information from the Senate Watergate Committee. We got information from the grand jury. And as I said before, it was a covered a vast scope from 
illegal wiretaps to um, bribing a judge to uh, trying to uh, thwart Congress's uh, inquiry to the IRS, the enemies list and all that stuff. There was a lot, a lot, a lot. And I remember one of my reactions was I felt as though when we were, we were sitting there being, the, the facts were being read to us page by page. And the reason that was a very smart procedure that I don't know who, whether that was Rodino who figured it out or John Doerr, our Republican counsel. But what it meant was that every member of the committee had to listen. And if they, so they never could complain, oh, you used that fact, but I never heard that before, or that fact wasn't true. Because if you wanted to challenge the facts, you had the right to challenge it. But if you didn't challenge it, you had to keep quiet. So everybody had the same information in front of them. They had to listen to it. And we did listen to it. And uh, that was one of the reasons I think that everybody had this sense of overwhelming misconduct, abuse of power. Everywhere you turn, that's where yeah. what Nixon was doing. And I felt as though there was, I was in quicksand and there was no bottom at all. So the, what pe many people may not recall was your involvement on the Judiciary Committee extended after the resignation. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, and I think that's a very important thing. In fact, I, I very vividly remember your role because the although Nixon resigned with the full knowledge that he would have been impeached and probably would have been found guilty in the Senate. No, no, that, not that, probably. For sure would have for been. For sure. Convicted. Okay, good. I love that, for sure. So there you go, there's sort of that incompletion of the process that we've done all this right. investigative work. And in the end, the president got on a helicopter and flew away, and then there was a new president. But the committee at one point must have said, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. We wanna know what happened. How did that happen? So President Ford was called before your committee in the Judiciary Committee. And if I recall, you were the one that asked him about the, it was there, Mr. President, I don't know exactly how you said it, but was there a quid pro quo? Did you say to, did President Nixon say to you, I'll tell you what, I'll get on a helicopter and leave. I'll resign. You get to be president. You're my vice for you get to be president, but you have to promise to pardon me as your first act as the president, which I suspect everyone in America, including the Judiciary Committee, thought was really suspicious. So the first, so you, you a 31 year old Congresswoman, asked that question of the president of the United States. So I have two questions. The first, why did Ford show up? Trump would have never showed up. Why did, why did Ford so willingly you know, get in a car and show up and appear before your committee? Ford showed up because he knew, I believe, that the way to, um, the way to defeat the suspicion that mm -hmm. something nefarious was going on, that there had been a deal about the pardon, was to appear open and candid. And he also knew that the House rules were such that anybody got gets five minutes to ask a question and they ask their first question and he can filibuster. And he also knew most of the people on the committee because they'd all served with him. And so they would be friendly. And that's what happened. He showed up, everybody said, I have a great cartoon about this that was done in a newspaper. You know, Mr. President, thank you for your candor, your goodness, your openness, your honesty. Nobody asked him a tough question. I was low person on the totem pole. <laughs> I was the last one to ask any questions. And I was hoping somebody would ask the questions before me because, you know, 30, I was 32 by that time. <laughs> so you're saying you were, you were just sitting there surprised that no one asked the most Absolutely. obvious question. Absolutely. And you're saying, this is just bananas. How is everyone just right. complimenting him of his candor without getting to the heart of why we called right. him for him? And, and actually, right. So I asked him the questions. And actually before that, because I'd been trained in some pretty good law firms in New York, that you don't have a hearing, you don't go to court unless you've taken depositions, unless you've done your evidence, you know, you've looked at the evidence, which, which is what we did in the impeachment process. So I said, and we had some democratic caucuses once we had these, uh, once we knew we were gonna have a hearing on the pardon and the president was gonna come, I said, you know, we should be getting documents, whatever documents there are and interviewing the witnesses, the people who were involved in the issuance of the pardon to find out what was going on so we can ask the president intelligent questions. Liz, that's a great idea, they said. Fantastic. 
they yes me to death. They refused to do any investigation. They did not want to find out the truth. And to this day, even though President Ford denied that there was a deal, you can see that, uh, that there could have been one because here's, my, here's what I think happened. Um, the Republican Party was facing midterm elections. We, the, the Supreme Court, Nixon resigned on, the, I think, the 8th of August. Okay. If he hadn't resigned, there would have been an impeachment vote. There would have been uh, a vote in the House of Representatives. I don't know how long it would have taken to, to do that, but probably by the end of August, maybe, or maybe even early September, there would be a vote in the House. And then you'd have to get ready for a trial in the Senate. And that probably would have taken place sometime at the end of September, early October. Early November, we were going to have the midterm elections. The Republicans understood that if Nixon were standing trial at that point, and you had John Dean saying that Nixon <laughs> ordered payoffs to the burglars to keep them quiet, and then you have the tape recordings saying, oh, you know, I know where you can get the money to pay them off. This would have been devastating as it was. The Republican lost a large number of um, seats in that election. So there was every political incentive to, incentive to get him out of office. And I believe that's the reason that you had Barry Goldwater and you had the head of the, of the Republicans in the House and the head of the Republicans in the Senate go to see Nixon and tell him he had to leave office because he had no chance of winning. Mm -hmm. And so there was a very good political reason. And I think that that's what happened. And, and one of the things that makes you really suspicious is that Ford in granting him the pardon gave him all the documents, all of his private papers, all the information that he'd never turned over, which would have been a huge cover up. Congress had to act right away to stop that. Hmm. So why would you do that if you had clean hands? But the president asked, answered you very curtly right? He did not go into detail. He simply said there was no deal. And I think he seemed, I guess you're, I guess now it makes more sense because you're saying he was swimming along beautifully with his buddies until he showed up with Holtzman, right? Because he thought this is easy. Who wouldn't want to show up to Congress? Everyone loves me. And then there you were asking him the one question everyone didn't. And that's why he was so curt with you and didn't get into any detail. There's so many questions from the audience. So let me just say one, I wanna make one comment and then it's something the audience doesn't know, but it's one of the many reasons you remain forever one of my heroes, which was the, of the Holtzman Amendment. Um, people don't realize that after World War II, there was the Displaced Persons Act, Congress passed legislation that fast-tracked uh, naturalization and uh, protection for people who were victims of the Holocaust, essentially, who were persecuted by the Nazis. And it created a fast track for naturalization. But by the 1970s, we started to realize that there were Nazis living among us who sort of came in under the Displaced Persons Act and lied on their visa applications and said, oh, no, no, no I wasn't involved with the Nazis. I was a baker. I was a butcher. I, I wasn't involved in any of that. So you passed the Holtzman Amendment, which was essentially the legislation that led, to, and also it created a new branch of the Justice Department called the Office of Special Investigation. You are the one that set in motion Nazi hunting in the United States. You did it yourself. You created the office in the Justice Department. You know, my parents came to this country because of the Displaced Persons Act, and the Holtzman Amendment is the one, is the legislation that created the arm of the Justice Department to kick people out of this country who had committed crimes uh, 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 for the Nazis, who were henchmen, complicit. And I just think this is something we, I wanted you to know, I think you do know, we had thought of showing not all the president's men, but showing judgment at Nuremberg because of Liz Holtzman's Holtzman Amendment. Unfortunately, it's very hard to get uh, that movie on streaming services. So we went with the more obvious choice, but I want you to know there's yet, there's not just Watergate, that Liz Holtzman should be remembered for. If you, if you think that, you know, if you've heard of Nazis who had been deported out of the United States, you can owe that to Liz Holtzman as well. Uh, uh, let's take some questions from the audience. This comes from actually a board member, Breck Feeder. Uh, do you not agree that the heroes of Watergate from a political standpoint are the Republicans in the House and Senate 
who chose country over party and held Nixon accountable for his crimes. How sad is it that 99% of the GOP today has no such character, courage, or strength? Well, I don't know if they're the real heroes. There are a lot of heroes in Watergate. Um, Judge Sirica is a hero in Watergate. Archibald Cox was a hero in Watergate. The Watergate prosecutors were heroes. Um, Butterfield was a hero for telling the truth. John Dean ultimately was a hero for telling the truth. So I, I don't, but I do agree that unlike for the rest of us, voting for the impeachment of Richard Nixon was, I, I, was not a big political price for most of the Democrats, but it was, a, it was a big political risk for the three Southern Democrats and for the seven moderate Democrats who voted for impeachment. And that took huge courage. And I, uh, they are heroes, but along I with think, the other heroes. I um, think what, yeah. Right. I think what his point is, I think, in part, is that we see during the Trump uh, impeachment, Republicans lined up solidly, regardless of where they were from, you know, moderates, conservatives, everyone lined up. Um, here's a question from, uh, let's see, uh, where does this come from? I heard this, saw this a moment ago. Um, well, it's a very sad commentary on the Republican Party today. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cam Leong says, did politicians in the past have more integrity than today? Are politicians today only interested in getting reelected regardless of doing the right thing by catering to special interest groups because they will come out to vote while the silent majority won it? I mean, Liz, surely there were uh, special interest groups in 1972. Oh, yeah. Right? I mean, it, it, do you think? do you think that that the, that the politicians, this is a similar question to what we just got, were, were made of more moral stock in 72? I don't know the answer to that. I think certainly if you look, compare the Republicans today with the Republicans that I serve with in the House of Representatives, seven of whom, you know, were willing to take a, uh, willing to lose their seats. Plus, you had the three Southern Democrats who also could have lost their seats and didn't. Will, were willing, had that kind of courage. I don't know the answer to that question. I think, though, that the campaign finance laws, the whole issue of campaign finance has changed the character of our politics, too. I mean, now you need so much money yeah. to, to win office and to stay in office that it becomes, you don't even have time to do your work. You're on the phone constantly raising money. Um, hmm. So that that's a big distortion of, of the process. That and did not exist then. That, not in the, to the same degree. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I won my seat with a, just a minuscule amount of money today. It was, it was 34, 30, 32,000 is what we spent and we borrowed four. I was, so 32,000 is ridiculous. Four. Nobody can win a primary like that today. Right. And so here I was, somebody without rich parents, uh, without having had a whole history of buckling under to the political machine, elected to Congress. So I was a free bird. How, how often does that happen today? Not anymore. This, uh, this actually comes from our chairman of the board, Jeff, from Jeffrey Lenoble. Who's a I know is a Watergate uh, 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 scholar of sorts. Uh, he says, "Did everyone know that Deep Throat was Mark Felt, and isn't he the hero who doesn't get much credit?" Oh, I don't know when everybody. I mean, certainly I didn't know, and I don't think members of the committee knew about Deep Throat or who he was. Um, but we had to deal with the facts that we had. I mean, the facts that Deep Throat was talking about was what was going on, the cover-up that was going on, but we <laughs> were finding out about that cover-up other, from other sources and in other ways. Yes, of course. I mean, the people who were willing to step forward, it took a lot of courage and I, I uh, honor them. Let's uh, take one last question from the audience and say goodnight to Liz. This comes from uh, L. Goldberg. Do you think the case against President Nixon in the Watergate impeachment was weaker equally as strong or stronger than the case against President Trump? Well, there, the, the, the evidence against Nixon was overwhelming and um, he could have been prosecuted based on that evidence. And his top aides were prosecuted and convicted and sent to jail. Um, I think the evidence against Trump is very strong. 
but uh, to some extent, the, the prosecutions, the investigations weren't completed. That's the difference. I mean, here we have an attorney general who seems not to be investigating uh, everything that, that Trump did. Now we find out about his, his uh, disposing of, of um, evidence, uh, documents that evidence. White House documents, shredding them. I mean, he threw them down the toilet. So in Watergate, they shredded the documents. There's no, no difference. I mean, in a way, <laughs> Trump is just replicating what we saw before. A president who <laughs> right takes the charge and, and uh, abuses the power of his office and covers up uh, but the difference is that we had a really thorough and effective prosecutor, independent counsel, and we had uh, a Congress that acted in, a pro in an appropriate way. All right, before we say goodnight to Liz, Liz, this was just incredible fun. So thank you for being you. such an too. always winning guest and such a sweet friend and kind friend to me all these years. So thank you, Liz. Thank you um, very much. But um, before we say goodnight to Liz, just some quick questions, quick announcements, I think. Uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, we're, we're still haven't gone live yet, uh, but uh, we, um, we, uh, uh, we're, we've been virtual and without selling tickets for all this time. And so we still, we're out there asking uh, people to in, donate to their favorite new nonprofit, the Forum on Life, Culture and Society. Um, I wanted to say I was just stumbling a moment ago because I think I should let you know, Liz, that uh, a lot of people donated to folks over the last 24 hours, uh, and that was because of you. Uh, I didn't even make a pitch, no appeal. Uh, the mere fact that you were appearing, uh, yes, they recognized the tickets were free, and they made donations to folks instead. So thank you, Liz, for that, and for those uh, people out there who, who recognize that this is an amazing event that we were about to host and that you, in advance of the event, you trusted that folks knows what they're doing and that Liz would be charming and brilliant as usual. And you've donated to folks even without me making uh, my awkward pitch every at the end of every event. Uh, if you haven't yet signed up for our mailing lists, yes, folks.org. Uh, we have a lot of events coming up. I, nothing I can announce yet, as you all know, we, uh, some of our events are put together very quickly. Our last event with the Netflix series, In From the Cold with Margarita Laviva, was put together in six days. So uh, that's how you know from Facebook and from uh, mostly from our email list. So please uh, sign up for our, our events. Liz, uh, you are a dear friend, a New York treasure. And I, you know, during a pandemic, it's important to point out, please stay healthy, Liz. <laughs> Because the world, the world is just really a lot better with you in it. Well, so thank you. To say that. Thank you thank very you. much. But can I just uh, yes. make one correction? I didn't, it wasn't legislation that created the Office of Special Investigations to hunt down Nazis. I did it myself as chair of the immigration subcommittee. I didn't need legislation. So they persuade the Department of Justice to do it. Right. So the, the Holtzman Amendment is the amendment that was attached to the Displaced Persons Act that allows for the deportation and denaturalization of Nazis found in the United States. The Office of Special Investigation, you simply had the authority to go to the criminal division of the Justice Department. And I didn't know that. Um, yeah, it wasn't uh, the criminal division. I went to the, to the tippy top, not the attorney general, but the deputy attorney general. We got it, yes, because they didn't want to do it. And I said, you either do it voluntarily or I'll write it into law and they create well, it. Well, let me just ask one quick question before we say goodnight. So, and I never knew the answer to this, but you're opening up this question. Uh, there was no, at the time that you were doing this, it was not as if that there was a groundswell movement no. of outrage, right? It wasn't like people were saying, there are Nazis living here? No, there that was no wasn't Watergate. it. There was no Watergate outcry, no. I mean, you just it's did just this- just my outcry. Hmm. I just love that ending on the night it was my outcry. <laughs> you can't leave on a better note. Uh, Liz, we love you. Uh, Thank you. Really, Thank very you so grateful much, to you. Good night. Thane Rosenbaum for folks. Good night until next time. Thank you.